Many people struggle with the Bible. They know the Bible is valuable, they know it's important, but they're not sure where to start, they get stuck somewhere in the middle, and as a result, they end up missing out on the life-changing power of God's Word. And Scripture is full of all kinds of stories that tell this one story. God is a rescuer. God is a redeemer. God is a provider. God is a deliverer. God is all those things, isn't he? Yeah, yeah. Hey, man, that's awesome. Hey, we are so glad you're here. If you're a guest, thank you so much for being here. You guys, it has been such an exciting week. As Tammy shared with you guys earlier, uh, I'm just going to really embarrass people for the next few minutes. It's going to be awesome. So just be glad that you may not be one of those people. It'd be awesome. Uh, Flynn family, for you just quick, raise your hand. So Friday night, we had over 125 people from our community and special needs and these people were the mastermind behind this grand caper. And everybody had a volunteer. It was awesome. And right now, Barb is saying, Dwayne, I told you we should have sat out in the atrium. Okay, awesome. Because then, you know. All right, hey, if you were a volunteer for that bad boy, if you were here for Night to Shine and you had something to do, would you just please stand up real quick? Because it was awesome, man. Would you guys just please? Oh, I see. Yeah, hey, stand up, man. That was awesome. That was awesome. You guys, so much fun. And if you weren't here last hour, like uh, some of the uh, kings and queens showed up before church last hour, we actually had them come up here and they led the first song in worship. It was awesome, man. It was so much fun. Anyway, that was a really cool, uh, cool moment uh, uh, here at church. Then the If Gathering was absolutely fantastic. I, hey, I wanted to also just celebrate, uh, again, this may seem like a broken record, but it's not meant to be. Um, what God did last week was absolutely incredible. Um, with the whole missions piece, our church together, collectively, what we did between the three services is we funded the good news of Jesus Christ going out in the world to the tune of $434,000. I mean, wow, wow. If you're going to invest your life in something, invest it in sharing the good news. If you're going to invest and look for an eternal reward that can't be shaken, that cannot, that, that the bottom's never going to drop out of that, invest your resources in sharing the good news. And I just wanted to say thank you guys so much from the bottom of my heart. Um, and I want to say, God, thank you so much for showing up in the way that you did. And so, so cool. And there's still an opportunity for you to do that, and I hope that you do. All right, so I'm excited. Again, I'm just I'm excitable, but, um, you know, the thing I'm excited about is we're starting a brand new series today, and uh, we're starting this thing that is called The Good Book, and it's going to be a comprehensive overview of God's story, of life, of where it began, how it began, how we fit in. And it's going to be an absolutely incredible uh, study, whereas we're going to look over the next 40 days, we're going to look at 40 chapters in Scripture and then after each chapter that we read, what's going to happen is that there's just a short synopsis of what we just read. And it's not just something that we're looking at in here. This is a church-wide study, meaning that, um, meaning that student ministries is going to be involved, children's ministry is involved, community groups are going to be involved. And so we're going to be having like conversations 2.0 about God's word in uh, all throughout the church over the next 40 days leading us into Easter. And I want to tell you this. Here's what you can expect. Here's the goal of the entire series is that we would begin to see the world the way God sees it. Now that's a big shift because when we look at the world through our set of brokenness, sometimes things line up and other times things get a little bit muddy, they get real cloudy. And so what's going to happen over the next 40 days, I believe, is that as we read these 40 chapters that will reveal the big ideas of the Bible, our relationship with Jesus is going to grow. That's going to be a good thing. And over the next 40 days, as we get into God's word, and as we look at the big ideas of the Bible, you can expect something else. As your relationship, as your love for God grows, your love for people will grow. 
Don't you wish that there was just some people it was easier to love? And if we could do it on our own, we would have already done it. But thank God that it is only through his strength and his love that we're able to do that. And I promise you that over the next 40 days, if you will travel along with us, you, as your love for God grows, your love for people will grow. And something else is going to happen. So as we go throughout this study, over the next 40 days, what's going to happen is as we dive into God's word and as we look at his story, as we look at the big ideas, this is going to happen. We will begin to see the world less and less through our eyes. And we'll begin to see history. We'll begin to see current events. We'll be able to see people through God's eyes. How exciting would that be able to be? To be able to love people like Jesus because we can see them as God sees them. It's going to be an absolutely fantastic, fantastic few, uh, few days around here, few weeks around here as we go into this thing. And the other thing I would just say, not to, not to um, get too carried away, but what I would say is if there is any resentment in your heart over any certain area, if there's something in there, again, as you pursue God, you will see God remove that resentment and replace it with joy. And you'll see him bring dead things in your life back to life as we run after him. All the same, if you're just here checking church out for the very first time, if you're a guest here at Highland, whether you're online or whether you're here, we are so thrilled you're here, and I hope that you'll choose to join us. And I want to let you know that as soon as service is done, you can walk through these doors to the left of that place where we build relationships, and you can grab your book, and you can journey along with us. There's groups that you, there's a group of people that you can meet with that will embrace you and say, hey, walk through this thing with us. But man, before you leave, if you're not signed up for this thing yet, don't leave today without getting signed up. And if we need to order your book, we'll totally do that, and it's going to be absolutely awesome. Okay, so again, the goal of this series is that we would see the world through God's eyes. And it's interesting as we talk about the, even on the cover of the book, it just talks about talking and revealing God's biggest ideas, the big ideas in the Bible. Well, people have different ideas about God, don't they? When it comes to God, are people's ideas like all over the map? I mean, some people have the idea that God is out to get them. Have you ever met that person? They're walking around just waiting, lightning, they're like, lightning, the building's going to crash, lightning's going to hit me. Somebody somewhere, they bought into this lie that God is a vengeful God and he's just looking to take them out. Other people have the idea that God it just exists to please us. Is either one of those views accurate? Oh, that's interesting. You see, some people, when it comes to God, they have uh, this crazy idea that God could never love them. And maybe that's because of the home that they grew up in, that if their family who is supposed to love them doesn't love them, how could, a, how could a perfect God love them? Other people have the idea that God loves them so much that he allowed his son Jesus to die for our sins. He rose from the dead so that he could extend us life. You see, people got all these ideas about God. How are we supposed to know, like, what's real? How are we supposed to know what's real, what's false? How are we supposed to separate fact from fiction? Like, how can we know what's true? How can we know what's false? And what I have come to find, and what I have found, is that the Bible is the source of truth because God himself is true. And so where I go is I go to God's word because I found God's word to be true. Because he himself is true. And what I would say is, is if there is an idea out there that you believe with God, you've got to run it through the filter of his word. And if your thought is not consistent with God's word, you need to let that idea die. Because it's not true. However, if what you believe about God to be true is consistent throughout his scriptures, well, glory, hallelujah, hallelujah. That would be a truth worth sharing. That is a truth that the world needs to know. 
Now you see, the reason that I'm saying that God is true and that his words are true is because if you go all the way back to Genesis, I'm just telling you, uh, you can stand on this and think about the good news of God's word for our culture. Like our culture is like shifting sand, isn't, aren't they? They're like, hey, what's true for you might not be true for you. And what's true for you may not be true for you. And you've got all these like moving parts and people are winding up depressed. People are winding up empty because they're trying to put something, hinge their life to something that won't, the bottom won't drop out of. They're trying to build their life on something that won't just cave and fall apart with popular topics. And what I found is you can trust God because God has been consistent all throughout history. You can actually, you can actually open up the, the scriptures beginning in Genesis all the way to the end, and you will find that God is consistently faithful, that he is strong enough to support your life. So he is strong enough to give you life. And that is just, again, one of the many, many things and many of the reasons that I say go to God's word. In fact, this morning when I was looking uh, through God's, God's word, I knew that uh, you'll all know this, or most of you will know this. It is the number one selling book of all time. That part's cool. But as of this morning, there's this Bible app called YouVersion. Over 309 million different, 309 million downloads have been downloaded uh, of YouVersion Bible as of this morning. And it's still counting. You can go to uversion.com and you can see people downloading this thing. Now, why on earth would they be downloading this app? Is it because church people haven't heard about it? Now they're just hearing about it for the first time? I would tell you, maybe. But I think that people are downloading it and going to it because they're sick of what culture has to offer. And they're looking for truth. They're looking for something of substance that will make a difference in their life. And when they open this word, this word that is more than a book, it is living and active. And God speaks to them and he gives us hope and he gives us a future through his son Jesus. And so as we open up God's word today and as we look at the Bible's first big idea today together, I just want to let you know we're just on the journey of seeing the world through God's eyes. So if we were to talk about today, and we're going to, what is the first big idea of the Bible? We'll be looking at seven of them over the course of uh, this series. But the first big idea of the Bible is simple. It's life. The first big idea of the Bible is life. Life is God's idea. When you go all the way back to Genesis, we read this. We read this. In the beginning, what? And what did he do? God, God created. Okay, you guys got to go run this out a little bit further. In the beginning, God created what? He created the heavens and the earth. In the beginning, God created. Man, who created life? God. When did, when did life begin? Who did it begin with? It began with God. You see, we got this whole thing turned around. Sometimes we want to make life about us, don't we? Man, if you go through the, if you go any part in scripture, who are you going to find center stage? You're going to find God. Why? Because life is actually God's idea. It's his idea from beginning to end. It was him. God is there when time has a beginning. God is there when life has a beginning. And we're able to see how he ordered it. We're able to see how he established it. And we're able to see how it came to be, where we fit in, what we were created for. It is all there. There is God expresses who he is and that life is his idea. Does anybody in here ever drive you cuckoo when somebody steals your idea? Anybody have somebody steal your idea before? Like you had a good one and somebody stole it. They're like, oh, hey, I got an idea. And they got promoted and made like $20,000 more. And you just like, what the heck, man? Dude, let me tell you about this. Nobody likes having their good ideas stolen. And there's this tendency in human nature, stick with me, pay attention right here. There's this tendency in human nature to make life about us. To make life about me. Like, look at what I've done for me. Look at what I want. Look at what I've done. This thing is all about me. As 
we go throughout this series, as we open up God's word, and as we look this first week at just this, this idea that life is God's idea, as we open God's word, what we find is we're just a subplot in a much grander story that all points back to God. And any time and every time we try to make life about us, we're trying to take credit for an idea that was never ours in the first place. It's always been his idea. And our very existence is to point back to his glory and to his goodness and to his faithfulness. I hate it when people steal ideas, but sometimes we try to steal the idea that life was our ideas when all along it was God's. Well, this week in your reading, and what, I, what we're going to do is we're going to be really careful in here to make sure that you have fresh, actionable content that pertains to, so that way when you get into the book, th that you're going to get new content there as well. And so we're going to cover some themes for sure, but you will get fresh content as you open the book because we don't want it to be like, well, I already heard it. I don't need to get this or be a part of this. And so in this week's reading, you guys are going to meet four people. You're going to meet four people who are living in real time, and they all have a relationship with God. And they're all going to make a decision about life that has an impact on their relationship with God, that whose impact extends far, that has a much deeper reach than what they could imagine. The first two people that you're going to meet as you read this week are the first two humans recorded in history. Their names are Adam and Eve. And they're living in relationship with God. God puts them in this cool garden called... Eden, okay, I just wanted to make sure that you guys weren't asleep yet. Awesome. Okay, and he's in relationship with them, and he lets them look at, he's like, everything in this garden, I created. I created you, I created this place. You can feast your eyes on all of it, and you can know, you can know its goodness, and you can partake in it, all of it, except this one tree. I don't want you to eat. You can eat anything in here, just don't eat uh, of, this tr of the fruit of this tree of knowledge of good and evil. But if you're familiar with history, you know that Adam and Eve chose to disobey God. How many of you guys growing up, uh, when you disobeyed your parents, you had one of them come and say, you know what, you crossed the line. You disobeyed me. Do you remember that talk? I remember that talk. I remember it so well. When I tell my boys something and they cross that line, I give them the same talk my father gave me. It's not a fun talk. What I would tell you is that Adam and Eve made a decision about life. They made a decision in their relationship with God, and they disobeyed him. And in disobeying God, Adam and Eve chose to cross a line, and life, is, as life has been known, was completely altered. Sin entered the world. Life as we knew it, life with God as we knew it, was completely altered when Adam and Eve crossed the line. And if you ever want to know, man, if you, ever, if you ever think, well, they just ate this fruit, I mean, how bad is it? Could, how, how bad is it? Any rebellion against a perfect, holy, and loving God is a bad deal that carries steep, steep consequences. And I'd love for you to turn with me right now to Genesis chapter 6, because I want you to see, God allows us to see how he feels about this. Adam and Eve, they cross the line, they disobey, and sin enters, sin enters the human race. We're separated from God. And in Genesis chapter 6, verse 6, we see how God feels about this. Check this out. The impact of sin is so awful, and it says the Lord was grieved. That's how my translation reads. Is, uh, but your translation may read different. Your translation may read the Lord regretted. What grieved God? What was it that he regretted? He regretted that he had ever made man on earth. You see, Adam and Eve crossing the line with God was a big, big deal. When they crossed the line, God, his heart is so filled with pain, the, the presence of sin, so painful, so ugly, uh, coming uh, in the presence of this holy God, that he's filled with grief that he had ever made man. So the Lord said, I will wipe mankind whom I have created from the face of the earth, Men, animals, creatures that move along the ground, the birds of the air, for I am grieved. I've regretted that I've ever made them. 
is we look into this whole big idea that life is God's idea. When sin enters life, God is grieved at its impact on humanity. And we get this insight into God's, into the destructive nature of sin and how God views it. Well, things aren't looking so hot. Crossing the line comes with steep consequences. But in the very next verse, we meet a man named Noah. And if you look at what verse 8 says, after God says, hey, I regret ever making mankind, that's how he feels like. As he looks down from his throne room in heaven, and he's like, oh, my word. This is nothing like what I've created. As he looks down on all of humanity, there stands alone a bright spot. A man named Noah. And we look and we get to read in God's word what God sees. It says that Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. There was something. Noah made a decision. There was something about Noah that God looks down and when he's ready to wipe out all of humanity, he sees Noah and he stops. He's like, whoa, wait a minute. Noah found favor with God. Why did Noah find favor with God? I don't know if we have verse 9 up, but you can certainly follow along in, in, uh, in your Bible with me. But it says, he found favor because Noah was a righteous man. He was a godly man. He was blameless among people. And he walked with God. You see, while the rest of the world saw, saw a line that they weren't willing or that they would gladly cross, the world looks out and they're like, I'll cross that line. I'll do this. I'll do this. Noah made a different decision with his life, had an impact on the world. What decision did Noah make? At some point in Noah's life, Noah made the decision to draw a line. And Noah just said, There are some lines I will not cross. There are some things that God has ordered that I will not cross that line. I am going to live my life to honor God, and as a result of honoring God, we read that he was blameless before men. Isn't that interesting? It doesn't mean that men didn't want to accuse him, that men didn't want to poke fun of him, but he was blameless before men. Why? Because he lived his life to honor God, and how did he do that? He drew a line. And he's like, there are some things that I won't cross. Yeah, I see you crossing these lines over here. And Noah's not perfect, and I'm not propping him up as perfect. I'm just saying that Noah made a decision in his lifetime to draw a line. The next person we'll meet this week as we read is a guy named Abraham. If you grew up in children's ministry, you absolutely love this guy because he's got such a fun song to sing. Do you remember singing Father Abraham? He had many sons. Many sons had Father Abraham. It was awesome. Well, Abraham, he's going to make a decision. You see, God is going to God is going to enter into a relationship with uh, with into a relationship with Abraham. He's going to enter into this agreement that is becomes known as a covenant, and God is going to establish the nation of Israel through Abraham. And from the nation of Israel will come one who will be a blessing to all nations. See, God's going to establish His people. He's going to establish a picture of, to the world of what it looks like to be in a right relationship with Him, and He's going to do that from. Abraham, but he's not going to do that with Abraham from where Abraham sits right now. He's got to do some things in Abraham's life, and Abraham has to make a decision about life and about his relationship with God, basically meaning, will I trust you, God? Will I let you lead, and will I follow? Abraham's got to make that decision, and Abraham comes through, and he decides to do what I call, he decides to walk the line. God invites him into the great unknown. Now, some of you guys are thinking Johnny Cash right now. You're like, man, I walked the line. Listen, you want to walk the line. You don't want the ring of fire. You want to walk the line. That one's going to stick. I can see it. They're like, oh, I'm going to think about that this week. Okay, all right, cool. All right, so he's going to walk the line. He, the, he can't see the end product. He can't see all the places and all the ways that God wants to lead. But he chooses to trust God with the outcome. He, choose to, he chooses to put his faith in him, and he chooses to walk it out and walk the line that God has placed in front of him and the path that he's placed for, uh, for him to walk. Now, here's where this whole thing comes all together. Each and every one of us in here and each and every one of us who have ever drawn breath have disobeyed God. We have all crossed the line when it comes to obeying God. 
And I dare say there's probably somebody in here this morning woke up and you're thinking about crossing a line. You're thinking about disobeying God. Like sin has got your attention. There is something in your life that has captivated you that you've let your heart fall in love with. And what I want you to, uh, what I want you to know is behind that allure of fun, as soon as you cross that line, as soon as you disobey God, and as soon as the fun wears off, what you will find is the same thing that Adam and Eve found, is that death and destruction are waiting to embrace you. So if you have not crossed that line, if you've been thinking about this sin, and you're like, I'm going to do it, I'm going to do it, I'm asking you to not cross that line. I'm asking you to draw a line and say, God, I'm going to draw a line in my life. I may not always get it right, and I probably won't be perfect, but I want my life to honor you. And this morning, I'm asking you to draw a line. Draw a line and say, there are some lines that are not meant to be crossed. And I'm going to live my life in such a way that brings glory and honor to you. Because I want to honor you, God, and I want to be blameless. I want to be blameless before you, before you. And thank God, because of Jesus, we can. And I also know that there's some folks in here, God's been trying to get your attention for a long time. He's been saying, I want you to walk with me. And if that's you, I want to encourage you to walk the line with God. Walk the path that he has before you. The good, the bad, the hard, the easy, the mountaintop, the valley. God will be with you through it all. I bet there's probably somebody in here who knows that I need to give my life to Jesus. You're probably that person who you crossed the line with God and you haven't looked back. But the beautiful thing about if you choose right now to walk with God, even though you've been walking 30 some years, 20 some years, 40 some years away from God, the beauty about God is you can walk that far away from him. But if you'll do an about face, you don't have to walk all those years back to him because he's standing right there. Maybe God's been asking you to walk the line with him, meaning I want you to serve me. He's got some plans for your life that you've been saying, no, not me. No, God, anything but that. And I'm going to ask you to take a step of faith, trust God with the outcome, and walk the line with him. Step into the plans that you have for him. Because, man, as we talked about people who crossed the line, if we talked about people who drew the line, we talked about people that walked the line, we learned three fascinating things about God. We learned three fascinating things about God and life. Here it is. The first one is, is that God is always ready to forgive. God's not holding a grudge. He's holding out grace and forgiveness. God loves you. We learn that about life. Life is God's idea, and he always leads with love. Write that down. That was good. That was the best one I've done yet, man. You should write that down. God always leads with love. Write that down. Here's the second thing. Man, Mike, remember that one. That was good. The second thing is this, is that God... Re God rewards a righteous life. I mean, you look at Noah. In a world that was crossing every line that God had ever drawn, Noah drew a line and God considered him righteous. And God rewarded him. While the rest of the world sunk, Noah was on the rise. Not because of his own doing, but because God rewards righteousness. Don't ever tire of doing good. Don't ever tire of it. We learn this. When life is God's idea, he rewards righteousness. And the third thing is that we learn about him is that God's plans are way better than anything we could chase on our own. Like what God has placed in front of us and where he's calling us and what he's inviting us into is significantly grander and greater than anything we could ever come up on our own. I mean, if Abraham just had this crazy idea, if Noah just had this crazy idea, well, I'm just going to do life here and hey, whatever happens, happens. You just go for fate. Oh, man, they stepped into God's life for them. And as we read through the big ideas of the Bible, you're going to see that life with God is abundantly better than life apart from God or anything that we could do on our own. 
And that's just what we learn in the first big idea of the Bible. This is going to be an absolutely fascinating series. Next week, we're going to talk about how we were created for a reason. And we'll talk about what that reason is next week. It's the second big idea in the scripture. And it's one you can hang your hat on. In fact, we've already kind of talked about it today. But we'll talk about it more next week. I want to say thanks for worshiping with us. I want to say thanks for traveling with us. And man, I really hope that over the next 40 days, whether you've been reading the Bible your entire life, I believe God has something new for you as you put on his lenses to see the world. Let me pray for us. Lord God, thanks so much for today. Thank you for a chance to worship you. Thank you for a chance to open up your word. Thank you for forgiving us. God, thank you for giving us strength today to do the work that you have in front of us. God, thank you for pouring your love into us so that one, we can feel loved, and two, we can share that love with others. God, we love you. And uh, May our lives bring glory and honor to your name. In Jesus' name, amen.